I believe over the coming months the industry, whether it's the airlines, the hotels, the whole travel industry is hurting and we need to come together to, to kind of really reassure customers. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Francis C. Sellers, a senior writer at the Washington Post. The coronavirus pandemic has been particularly hard on the airline industry, with air tra travel dropping to record lows. Here with me today to talk about the status of the industry is the CEO from JetBlue, Mr. Robin Hayes. Welcome, Mr. Hayes, and welcome to our audience around the country. Hey, Francis, how's it going? It's, uh, it's, uh... I'm looking at you and I'm looking at myself speaking. It's uh, good. We're all okay, a new experience. With this thing. Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd like to start with one issue that comes up among all my friends and colleagues when I talk to them about getting back in the air, and that is they're scared. I know that mm -hmm. JetBlue was the first airline to mandate the use of face masks, but what are you doing specifically to get back people back up in the air? No, uh, Francis. Uh, again, uh, th uh, thanks for having me today, and. Uh, I, I think that's the most uh, important issue that we face as an industry right now. That how do we give people confidence uh, to, to fly again? Uh, you know, we are seeing uh, in the US at least uh, volumes starting to come back, but still a fraction of what we would normally expect at this uh, time of year. So what we did at JetBlue is we rolled out our safety from the ground up uh, program, uh, and it had a number of uh, elements. The first thing is making sure our crew members are healthy and well. And we had to make some changes to some of our internal policies to make sure that if crew members weren't well, uh, if they had been uh, um, uh, tested for, for COVID and, and uh, tested positive, or if they'd been asked to quarantine, that they knew it was absolutely okay uh, not to come to work. Um, so that was, the, uh, that was the first thing. We've also rolling out actually from the 1st of June temperature checks as well for our uh, crew members. Uh, the second part of that is making sure our customers uh, didn't fly when they didn't feel well. So giving our customers the ability to rebook, re uh, change the dates of their flights uh, without penalty. Uh, so we we uh, introduced that um, uh, a couple of months ago, actually. Uh, the third the third part of our safety from the ground up program is uh, just um, uh, making sure that uh, airplanes are are sanitized. We call it. Uh, uh, you know, healthy air, making sure airplanes are sanitized, uh, that they're clean. Uh, airplanes have HEPA filters. I mean, I think uh, no one knew what a HEPA filter was now. And every time an airline executive <laughs> does something like this, we talk about HEPA filters. And we do it because actually what a lot of people don't know is the air in an airplane is recycled completely every three to five minutes. Um, we also uh, were the first airline to ask uh, customers to wear masks. Um, and then also um, uh, creating, you know, um, more space. Um, so we are blocking the middle seats. We are blocking aisle seats um, to uh, uh, make sure that you're never sitting next to someone uh, that you they don't know. So number yeah, um, to. Uh, uh, to download the app. It's always good for an airline when people download the app, but you know, use the app to check in, um, use the app to travel through the airport, scan the app when you get onto your airplane. Uh, and then amending so our service question, routines to reduce that. touch points. Um, how many of these changes do yeah. you think are passed? Will um, cancellation and change fees come back? Am I ever going to sit next to a stranger again on a plane? Well, I think you're going to definitely have to sit next to a stranger again, I'm afraid, on a plane because uh, the economics of our industry, uh, most, air, most airlines have a break even low factor of 75 to 80 percent. So clearly capping flights at 55 to 60 percent, which is what we're doing right now through to July the 6th, is not sustainable. But, you know, in terms of, um, you know, and I think you hear a lot of people talk about what's temporary, what's permanent. I do think that airlines are going to have to rethink um, you know, how they sell their product, because it's not ever really going to be acceptable, I don't think, for someone who is unwell to feel that they're being made to fly. And so I think airlines are going to have to think about how they, you know, um, monetize their fare structure, how they create products that give people the ability to change flights more easily uh, than perhaps they felt in the past they could. One of the innovations that we've heard about, not only uh, the HEPA filters, which you which you mentioned, but electrostatic mm. fogging. What is that? Oh, yes. How does it work? And how do you know it works on planes? 
Well, uh, you know, I um, <laughs> I remember when I started first flying uh, many years ago, you, you used to go to all these exotic places and the crew would come through with what looked like deodorant crayons. You know, they'd go down and they spray them into the air and all that stuff was landing on us and it was there to stop, uh, you know, stop insects and it had insecticide in it. Uh, thankfully, we've come a long way uh, since then. And, um, you know, what we're doing now is just a much higher level of cleaning. Um, and you can do that in a, in a number of different ways. You can do a, um, you know, a hand clean, or you can use these electrostatic cleaners. And what's that doing is really taking the product that we're using to sanitizing, sanitize the airplanes. And it's like a, an aerosol. You go through the cabin and you spray it, uh, and then it kind of gets into all the nooks and crannies that it's hard for someone to um, go in there with a hand and, and do. So again, the, the thing about safety on the ground, uh, it's a layered approach. There's not one single thing that you can do that is the silver bullet here, but it's a number of things that work together to create a sense that flying really is as safe as anything else you, you would do when you leave your house. So a number of our listeners and readers have um, sent in questions and they're particularly concerned, I think, about personal safety. One person, uh, Cindy Nea from California asks, uh, what do you do about people who are immunocompromised? Can you make special circumstances for them? Well, again, you know, everyone's got different um, um, health uh, um, issues. Uh, and, you know, I think everyone's going to have to make their own decision when it's safe to, to fly again. Um, you know, we believe that, um, you know, the use of masks, uh, keeping the seats next to you free, as we're doing for now, um, you know, we think that that is offering a significant level of, of protection. Um, but again, you know, everyone is going to have to make a decision to fly based on, you know, one, what they think their health risk is, and two, in what level of risk they're comfortable comfortable in taking uh, when they when they sort of do any activity. And so, which, you know, I think which, it's... It, yeah, which brings ahead, me sorry. to another question from a, a reader, a very interesting one from Jamie Bennett in California, who says, um, what are you going to do? What are you doing now? And what will you do about people who decide they do not want to ma wear masks when you get on their planes? Well, it's all these questions from California. Um, uh, <laughs> I think this uh, is Florida. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. This is um, no, uh, it's a good question. So the, the good news is the vast majority of our customers are complying uh, with the face mask um, directive. And that's very important. Look, we know that face masks aren't great to, to wear. I mean, you know, I wear it when I go to the store, I wear it when I'm on the street. Now, I don't love having it on, but, but you know, we, we do know it's a significant mitigant. And so we are asking all our customers to wear uh, face masks. Our in-flight crew members are amazing at persuading people sometimes to do things that they don't want to do. Uh, and so uh, we train them in how to manage conflict. Uh, we call it the ABCs, ask, bargain, and, and convince. Um, and again, when we go through that, most customers are uh, will do uh, wear the mask. You know, at the end of the day, though, if someone refuses to put a mask on before they board the airplane, we won't let them board. And secondly, when if they are in the air flight and they take their mask off, and again, if you have a medical issue, if you want to have something to eat or drink, like, Let's use some common sense, right? So there are times you're going to need to drop your mask to, to do something. But if you want to sit there and just not wear it and everyone else is aware you around it, then, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to uh, review whether we want that person to fly JetBlue again. Thankfully, that hasn't happened yet. Um, but, you know, the safety of our customers and crew members is paramount. This is the new flying etiquette, and at least until uh, there's a different solution to this. And we're going to have to accept that wearing a mask is less about protecting ourselves, but more about one of our sort of social obligations to protect each other. And there aren't any federal regu regulations at the moment overseeing cabin cleanliness, ticketing and that sort of thing. Do you believe there should be? Well, um, you know, I would say the industry has responded very quickly. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of cooperation that goes on in the US between the airlines and uh, our regulator, the FAA, on all safety uh, safety matters. And so, you know, we don't want to wait until regulations because we don't know how long that's going to take. We don't know if that's ever going to happen. So we got to get on and do what we think are the common sense things. And, you know, there are thousands of private companies, stores, shops, hotels, theme parks, all thinking about how they can reopen uh, quickly. You know, I think it's very hard to regulate if you should keep middle seats free. Um, uh, I do think where 
there is a role for regulation is in some of the things that we need to think about doing consistently around the world to help people get international travel going again. You know, we're seeing countries as they start thinking, opening their borders, all thinking about different ways of protecting their country. And I do think that could be very confusing if every individual country comes up with their own solution uh, as to how to do that. Let me ask you, though, about this country. Public health officials have made it very clear in this country that contact tracing, knowing where people have been, knowing where they're flying to, knowing who they've sat with is key to uh, preventing this disease from having a second wave or continuing to spread. But the airline industry has been in a 15 year at least battle lobbying not to uh, produce more information for um, public health officials. Where do you stand on that? What's the proper role of the airline industry here? Well, again, I think that, um, uh, you know, for, for contact tracing, we have those cases today where we are contacted by the CDC or state officials and we, you know, we cooperate and, and you know, we make sure that we do that quickly. Um, you know, I think um, some of the, um, uh, maybe what you're referring to was, you know, two or three months ago as um, some of these uh, flights were coming from um, China, you know, when at the beginning where everyone thought the virus was you know, coming from China, and then later, as maybe it's been coming from Europe as well. We're we're still learning that. You know, there were there were requests about how can we kind of get that information, and and it wasn't that the airline was resistant; that we didn't really have any the airline industry was resistant; that we didn't really have any tools that made that um, uh, easy right. to do. And so, A four A fifteen uh, years. Going back 15 years to SARS, there have been questions about how much data the airlines should collect and hand over. I think, um, and that's come yeah, to a head again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have privacy. It, it really isn't a question of like being resistant. It's really making sure that um, we have the the information. And, and again, we actually uh, offered as a, um, a, a US airline group through A4A, which is our trade association, to actually build a contact tracing app that we would all use uh, and could be used. Um, and again, so it's not that we're resistant. It's just that we need to make sure that what we do, you know, we have the, the technology and the tools that make that make that possible. Thank you. I have a question from Colorado this time. Susie Campbell oh, wow. is asking, yeah, who's asking um, about, you know, she's she's hearing what, what airlines are doing. She asked, what about airports? What can you tell us about what airports are doing to make that passage through the airport onto the airline uh, safer for passengers? Well, um, I think the, the best news about flying at the moment is there's not very many, many people doing it. Uh, and so airports <laughs> are naturally uh, very quiet. And so right now it's actually a very easy, I would say, uh, in the vast majority of cases to socially distance as you go through uh, an airport. You know, I think the challenge will be as 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 volumes start picking up again, how do you kind of, um, you know, maintain that safety? And so again, uh, some of the responsibility sits with airports, some sits with the airlines. You know, I think you'll see uh, again a big push on using mobile um, uh, technology. You know, I think you're going to see um, the seating configurations change in both where, you know, you can get something to eat and drink and also at the gates to spread people out. You know, you're going to see, I think, more floor decals to help prompt people to stay six feet apart as you're sort of uh, getting on an, uh, an airplane to make sure you don't all rush at the same time. Um, and, you know, airports have been really uh, good partners uh, in this in this whole process. And talking about seating reconfigurations, actually on board planes, um, I'm curious about how you think they may change and also whether um, by paying more, for example, going for you know a more expensive seat, people are likely to get more secure seats in this age of virus transmission. Yeah, I think, again, um, the, the question really be is what do we think um, changes over time? And, you know, clearly right now we are managing a pandemic, we're managing a great deal of valid concern that exists around, you know, people wanting to stay healthy when they fly. Uh, and, you know, uh, you can't look, even if you keep the middle seat free, you can't socially distance from someone else in terms of the six foot standard. And so at the end of the day, for uh, for true quote unquote social distancing on an airplane, you're probably going to take an airplane that's got 150 people on it today and at most you're going to get is 40 to 50. And that's just not viable. You know, I do think that people's desire for low fares, for all the benefits of travel, they're, they're going to still be there when we when we come through this. And so I think the things that you'll see changing are things like the sanitization of the airplanes, making sure it's a healthier environment. All those are good things. But I don't personally think longer term 
you're going to see significant changes to the way seats are configured on an airplane. You may get more people uh, choosing to buy a spare seat to kind of create that, create that space. Um, you know, some people do that today. I think that may be increased, but we also have to accept there's probably only a small number of people that will be able to afford to do that. And so it's what else can we do uh, to make sure people feel really safe when they fly? Right. And we've all become very good at Zoom. Here we are at the moment talking to each other and all the other forms, Skype, everything else. Yeah. Um, do you think business travel is going to pick up or are you preparing for a future in which there will be less business travel and possibly less vacation travel? Well, um, I, I think that um, actually uh, leisure travel will come back very quickly. Um, you know, people are, you know, we're not, we weren't wired to sit in our homes and uh, do these lockdowns. We did them because it was an important short term priority for public health reasons. But, you know, people want to travel. They want to see friends. They want to see family. Kids want to get back to college in the fall. Um, and so I, and, and particularly in the domestic US, I think a lot of people will maybe forego international trips this year. I've already done that. You know, I normally I like to go to Europe and see friends and family in the summer and, and we're going to do it in the US this year. So I think that traffic will come back quickly. I, I think business travel is going to be slower. And I think, um, again, some of that, there are certain sorts of jobs, you know, if I'm, you work in sales, a lot of relationship jobs, you want to travel, you got to travel, you can't really do a lot of that over Zoom. But there's also going to be, I think, some change that may be more permanent. Now, we are an 80% leisure carrier. For the last 10 years, we've been trying to make ourselves more dependent on business travel. Um, now, I'm kind of fairly happy that we're mainly a leisure uh, airline. Um, but, you know, business travel will come back, but I think it's going to take it's going to take longer. And so, you know, where we have, you know, like before this happened, we were flying 15 flights a day between Boston and Washington. We're not going to have 15 flights a day for a while, but, you know, maybe four or five or six. Uh, it's just going to be a much lower volume, I think, for business travel for a while. You, you've postponed JetBlue's own plans to have flights to London, I think. And um, where does that stand? And is it affected by London's public health regulations and decisions well, about what happens? Well, we're, still, we're still going. You can see London right there. Um, yeah, we, uh, we delayed a little bit. Uh, you know, it's still our uh, intent to go in 2021. We actually think that the US to Europe market will uh, be quite strong in the second half of next year. We think that it's probably going to take about a year for that market to uh, recover. Uh, so we're, we're still going, um, but it's probably delayed. You know, it's probably delayed a few months into later 2021. I've got another um, reader question for you. This one from Washington State. And this oh. is Jay Carmel. Let me read it to you. Will JetBlue use this downturn as an opportunity to reduce the average age of its fleet and adopt more fuel efficient planes, he asks. Well, that's a great question. And the good news is we were already doing that. So uh, in fact, December this year sees the uh, first arrival of uh, one of our Airbus A220 airplanes. Um, they are um, a uh, modern airplane, very fuel, fuel efficient. And uh, we're going to be taking 70 of those over the next few years, and those will gradually phase out our E190 uh, um, airplanes. Also, all of our A320s, um, um, we are going through a, a, um, a what we're calling a cabin restyling. So we are um, replacing the interiors of all of those with uh, new seats, new entertainment systems. So like when you get on it, it's going to look like new. And um, we were actually uh, just over halfway through that process when COVID hit and we kind of we've put that on pause and, you know, we'll pick that up again. Uh, once demand uh, uh, suggests we need the airplanes. But, oh yeah, within a couple of years, like every airplane that we have is going to either look new or be new. So last month, revenues were down 95%. I think you were 73% <laughs> no. um, flights less than half full. How's JetBlue um, faring now and what do you see in the future? Francis, you had to remind me of that. Yes. Oh, goodness me. Facts, yes, facts, you know. We do at the Washington Post. Facts. Yeah, no, I know. Yep. Well, look, here we are. So um, the good news is that we've definitely seen a little bit of uptick since uh, then. So you know, back middle of April was the low point, and uh, you know, U.S. industry was seeing about three to four percent of what they would normally see. You know, we're back up to about ten to eleven percent now. Um, I never used to know the TSA used to load their system uh, security numbers on uh, their website at nine o'clock every morning, which shows how many people flew through US airports the day before. Like I'm, I'm on that thing at 840 waiting for it to uh, load. Um, so you're definitely seeing a little bit of an uptick, but again, nowhere near where we were. So, you know, when we went into this, we had three 
main priorities. The first of all, you know, the safety of our crew members and our customers, and we've talked a lot about that already today. Secondly, to reduce uh, cash burn. You know, cash is king in this environment. Hear that from probably any organization that's trying to sort of conserve cash. Uh, so we were very aggressive at pulling down flying into May to reduce that cash burn, knowing that there's we were in almost a zero revenue environment. And thirdly, get ready for the recovery. Um, and so, you know, as we looked at May, we flew about 10 to 15 percent of our normal schedule. Uh, in June, we're probably going to be flying around 25 percent of our normal schedule. So again, you're seeing a small amount of uptick, um, but it's, you know, there is, a, we're assuming it's going to be a an L-shaped recovery. We're planning conservatively for that. Um, and it's going to be, a, I think, a significant period of time before revenues are back. You've had a significant boost also from the um, bailout, the federal bailout, about 935 million, I think, of the 58 billion. What have you used that money for? Yeah, so uh, yeah, the money came from the CARES Act, uh, it was, um, uh, rounded up, I think it was 936 million, um, but I should check that. And uh, look, we were very grateful uh, to the uh, the Trump administration, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, Secretary Chow, uh, members of Congress, uh, especially uh, the uh, our own uh, Senator Schumer here in New York. And, um, you know, that really gave the airline industry some time to breathe and some time to make sure that we were here as we went through this pandemic and coming out of the side of it. I think if it wasn't for the CARES Act, um, I can't speak for other airlines, but I think that certainly from a JetBlue perspective, the sensible thing to do would have been just to ground the fleet, furlough the vast majority of our people. We've never furloughed anyone before. So that would be hard. So all of that money uh, under federal law has to go directly to pay our crew members. Uh, and so that's what we're doing with it. The alternative would have been really um, and in fact, when the when the CARES Act was presented to us, you know, Treasury had said that they had estimated about 70 percent of the money that we were getting uh, through the CARES Act would would effectively have had to pay people's unemployment benefit and, and lost taxation uh, if they had not been if they had been furloughed. And so that 70 percent goes directly through the crew members instead of that in terms of wages and about 30 so percent. Have you, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, have you followed any of your employees since receiving this money? I believe you've been criticized uh, by some Democratic senators for violating no. the spirit of the CARES Act. None have been followed. No. Do, you continue, no. do you continue to pay all their health benefits and other benefits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't furloughed anyone. We have a number of voluntary programs that crew members have taken. You know, we do have a lot of crew members who uh, wanted to take the period, summer period off. And so we, uh, we actually have had um, over 60, about 60% 60 of our crew members take some form of unpaid time off, whether it's a day or a week or five months, um, but all of those are voluntary programs. So this has bought you some time, right? The CARES Act will take you through the summer months. How do you envision employment in October? Well, that's, um, you know, that's probably the question that I get asked the most at the moment, and we are spending a lot of time thinking about that. Um, you know, it's quite clear that when we get to October, demand is not going to recover to where it was. And so um, we do believe that we will be a smaller airline uh, than uh, we would want to do. And it's, uh, you know, that those are hard conversations to have. You know, it is our intent um, that we will try and manage this, if we can, through voluntary means. As I just said, 60% of people, of our crew members, have already taken some kind of voluntary time off plan for the summer. So. Um, you know, we're going to see, um, we're going to see how much interest there is. Uh, I think there's going to be substantial interest in continuing that. Um, and then we'll see where we are. And we'll only resort to uh, involuntary furloughs from the 1st of October uh, if we have to. And are there other strings attacked, attached to the CARES Act money that you're having to manage through these, these uh, critical months? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple, but I mean, I think they're both very reasonable. One, there was a uh, some limits on executive comp, which we support the executive compensation if you support it, if you're taking government money, you know, the last thing that you should be doing is uh, paying that out in sort of multi-million dollar uh, bonuses. Um, so we were supported of that. Uh, there is a requirement to serve um, markets. Um, so if we want to temporarily stop flying somewhere that we would normally have flied, we have to get an exemption from the Department of Transportation. So we've been following um, that process and then there is a, a restrictions on things like share buybacks and dividends for a period of time it, that for one year uh, if you take the cares act payroll support for for a period after that again 
um, share buybacks weren't really on the agenda anyway, because when you go through this, you're burning so much cash, your debt starts to really rise. And so you're going to, we're going to be very focused the next two or three years, delevering and paying off that debt rather than share buyback. So again, all of those restrictions were very reasonable. So has the government done enough for the airline industry, in your view? I, yeah, I think actually, um, I think that, um, by the way, not just the government, but Congress, because something like this could not have happened with uh, bipartisan support. And, uh, you know, we focus a lot on the differences these days. I will say that behind the scenes, I saw people uh, from across the aisle, both Republicans and Democrats, work very hard together to get this CARES Act over the line. And that was not an easy thing to do in such a short space of time. So I know you weren't with JetBlue during 9-11, but do you see a swifter or slower recovery for the industry in the wake of this disaster? I I think it's going to be a lot worse than 9-11. You know, I think there are two things going on here. There's the health issue where it's going to take some time. You know, some people are ready to jump on an airplane today. Others, they're not going to want to go near an airplane for a, a significant period of time, at least till they're um, confident that there's a vaccine or therapeutics or some other way that we've mitigated this. Um, so that you were dealing with that. And then we're also dealing with an economic issue, right? So we'll get through the health issue, um, but then, you know, how how is people's disposable income? Um, and what's the unemployment level? All of these have a significant impact on discretionary expenditure and people's ability to vacation and, and fly. So for both of those reasons, I, I think it's going to be a significant period of time before we see a return to 2019 levels. Right. And I understand that JetBlue has lost six employees um, to the coronavirus and that during an earnings call, you took a moment to talk about each of them and reflect on them. Um, what has this crisis meant in terms of your understanding of corporate leadership and your role in the company? Well, you know, I think that culture has always been extremely um, important to us at, at JetBlue. Uh, you know, I remember when, you, when, uh, when I first joined JetBlue on my first day, uh, I didn't join in the CEO role and you go to orientation, which is a training center in Orlando that every crew member goes through and you learn about servant leadership and you learn about, you know, you, it's about setting the right tone and not being, not, not being unwilling to do anything that you're asking your people to do. Now, you don't want me flying an airplane or fixing an airplane, but I can certainly do a lot of other things. And so, you know, we've always had that sort of family um, uh, feel here at JetBlue. And so, the loss of uh, a crew member is ex extreme. It, again, like it's, you know, six crew members lost to COVID, but every um, bereavement is hard. And the first crew member we lost, Ralph, I mean, I knew Ralph and he was not just a, a hero of mine at JetBlue, he was in our in-flight team. You know, he played a major role at 9-11 in the New York Fire Department. Yeah, and, um, you know, we, uh, whenever I see that of that New York Fire Department airplane, I. I still think of Ralph. And so everyone has a personal story, um, but those six people will be, um, you know, remembered. And, you know, we'll, we'll figure out once we're through this, uh, a more permanent uh, way of remembering uh, our six uh, crew members that we lost through COVID-19. Robin, thank you very much for that reflection. Um, and um, we all feel uh, that way about people we know who've lost to the virus, we've lost to the virus. Um, Unfortunately, that's all we have time for this afternoon. I want to Kidding thank you me. very much for joining. Gone away? <laughs> WashingtonPostLive.com. That was half an hour. Wow. All gone so quickly. Wow. So many interesting yeah. answers. Um, I want to remind our audience to tune into WashingtonPostLive.com to register for future events. We've got some great ones coming up tomorrow. Um, my colleague David Ignatius will be interviewing former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown about the impact on the global economy, along with former U.S. Treasury. Uh, Secretary Larry Summers. That's tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern. And after that in the afternoon, one o'clock, Karen Tamilty, also Washington Post columnist, will be interviewing a senior advisor to Joe Biden's presidential campaign, that, campaign, that's Simone Sanders. So tune in at WashingtonPost.com. Thank you very much for joining us today, and we'll see you again soon.